I, I do have a handout this time. No, no envelope, sorry. But this time, uh, nothing to hide from, from the beginning, okay? So, but uh, thank you for coming again. Uh, I apologize that you have to hear me speak again on the same day. But if you haven't looked at the handouts in the envelope from my talk earlier today, I'm going to start to, uh, I'm going to spoil it for you now. All right, uh, Mr. A is uh, Dr. David Anderson. Mr. B is Dr. Charlie Bing. Mr. C is Dr. Ken Wilson. And Mr. D is Dr. Jody Dillo. The new handout contains all the quotations from my slides today. And I'm going to make sure that it gets posted. The slides will get posted on the uh, Google Drive. So, you know, don't, again, don't feel free to have to take pictures or, you know, copy anything down. Now, Drs. Anderson, Bing, Wilson, and Dillo have all been associated with GS in the past. All have taught at GS conferences and written for GS. So I think the natural question after my morning talk is, why was there a close association with these individuals and GS in the past, given the fundamental differences between focused and flexible free grace today? So one explanation is that the unity in the past was based on being united on what we were against, Lordship Salvation, instead of being united on what we were for, the saving message of Jesus. While there's certainly truth to this, uh, my talk today is going to explore another explanation. That is that there was greater degree of unity because the views of these teachers in the past were closer to the focus free grace view. Here's a brief history of GS and its relationship with the Free Grace Alliance, or FGA, and Grace School of Theology, or GSOT. In 1986, GS is founded by Dr. Bob Wilkin. Even in the early years, assurance of eternal life is of the essence of saving faith, is an emphasized doctrine within GS. As you can see in this slide, from 89 to 99, GS, Zane Hodges, and Bob Wilkin had numerous books, articles, and conference messages emphasizing assurances of the essence of saving faith. Uh, Zane emphasized this in 89 with his book, Absolutely Free, and so did Bob in 99 with his book, Confident in Christ. So the claim by Dr. Anderson that this is a new doctrine emerging within GS in 2005 is untrue. This morning, I played clips from Zane Hodge's 2000 GS conference message titled, How to Lead People to Christ. In that message, Zane gave the two non-negotiables of the saving message. Number one, believe in Jesus of the New Testament. And number two, for the free gift of everlasting life. In that message, Zane made it clear that believing in Jesus for eternal life is the bullseye or focus of the saving message, not belief in Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection. There was controversy following that 2000 message, but the controversy centered on whether Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection were additional, essential content of the gospel. There was no controversy on whether eternal life, eternal security is essential. In 2002, Grace School of Theology, GSOT, in Houston is founded by Dr. Anderson and others as an evangelical institution emphasizing free grace. In 2004, the Free Grace Alliance is founded by Dr. Bing and others as a coordination and shared leadership ministry for free grace. Doctrinal differences were not an initial motivation for the founding of the FGA, but in the words of Dr. Bing, quote, doctrinal differences only emerge later, end quote. Doctors Anderson, Bing, and Dillo are members of the FGA and all have won FGA's Trophy of Grace Award. Doctors Anderson and Bing are past executive council members of the FGA. Dr. Wilson is a former member of the FGA and has lectured at FGA meetings in the past. Dr. Wilson is currently a professor at Grace School of Theology, where Dr. Anderson is president and Dr. Bing is an adjunct professor. Dr. Jody Dillo has been a commencement speaker for GSOT, and his book Final Destiny is published by Grace Theology Press, the academic imprint for GSOT. In 2005, GS amends their doctoral statement to add the following two clarifying statements, which Dr. Anderson calls new and unorthodox. Number one, faith is the conviction that something is true. To believe in Jesus, he who believes in me has everlasting life, is to be convinced that he guarantees everlasting life to all who simply believe in him for it. And number two, assurances of the essence of believing in Jesus for everlasting life. That is, until a person believes in Jesus for everlasting life, he has not yet been born again. If a person believes the promise of everlasting life to, to the believer, then he knows he has everlasting life. 
Dr. Anderson called these doctrines new and unorthodox, but many within GS, like myself, considered these doctrines as being taught and held by many within GS, even in the initial years. This was definitely true of Bob Wilkin and Zane Hodges. So the additions to the GS doctrinal statement in 2005 just clarified and memorialized doctrines that were already being taught within GS for many years. As discussed yesterday in the 2006 at the GS National Conference, Zane Hodges and Bob Bryan both independently gave messages that stressed the necessity of believing in Jesus for eternal life. Controversy erupted at that conference over whether eternal security is an essential element of the gospel. About 50% had a focused free grace view and regarded eternal security and assurance as essential, where about 50% had a flexible free grace view and regarded eternal security as an unnecessary addition to the gospel. Attendance at next year's 2007 GS conference dropped by over 50%. In 2008, the then executive director of the FGA and professor at GSOT, Dr. J.B. Hickson, publishes Getting the Gospel Wrong, a book accusing GS and Zane Hodges of a crossless gospel. Dr. Hickson complains that GS and Zane omit Jesus, deity, death, and resurrection as essential elements of the saving message. Hickson's book does not focus on the issue of whether the gift of eternal life is an essential element of the saving message. At Alaska Bible College in 2021, Dr. Hickson continues to mention the crossless gospel as a mistake within free grace that he is uncomfortable with. Dr. Hickson, again, does not mention the omission of eternal life from the gospel as a concern of his. Dr. Hickson also describes his departure from it, the FGA. The reason for his departure is the unwillingness of those in the FGA leadership to disassociate from GES. In 2009, FGA releases a public statement with the following gospel clarification on their website. Quote, the Free Grace Alliance is not associated with the Grace Evangelical Society and does not endorse the GS gospel, also referred to as crossless or promised only by some. We invite those who share our heart for the gospel's clarity and declaration of both the person and work of Christ to join hands with us. By 2012, this gospel clarification had been removed from the FGA website. In 2014, the then president of the FGA and current professor at GSOT, Dr. Roger Frankhauser, releases an article titled, What is the Primary Difference Between the Saving Message of GS and That of the FGA? His answer regarding the difference is, quote, Area of Disagreement. The primary difference between the two organizations is how they define the saving message. That is, whether it necessarily includes the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Some would include the necessity of believing in the deity of Christ as another key difference. The answer from Dr. Frankhauser regarding the primary difference between GS and FGA is again the necessity of believing in Jesus, death, resurrection, and deity. There is no mention or discussion about any difference regarding the necessity to believe in Jesus for eternal life. In 2020, Dr. Ken Wilson, professor of systematic theology and church history at Grace School of Theology, publishes Heresy of the Grace Evangelical Society, Become a Christian Without Faith in Jesus as God and Savior. Wilson's focus, as described in his title, is that GES leaves out the truths of Jesus as God and Jesus' work on the cross as Savior from the saving message. To his credit, unlike others, Dr. Wilson does discuss the distinctive that GES and Focus Free Grace have in believing in Jesus for everlasting life, as you may recall from the quotes from Wilson's book this morning. Doctors Anderson, Bing, and Dillo are all cited multiple times in Dr. Wilson's book. In addition, Doctors Anderson and Dillo each gave Dr. Wilson's book a five-star review on Amazon. The split in GES in 2006 was over the issue of the necessity of belief in Jesus for eternal life, eternal security. However, since 2008, the narrative that has dominated regarding the divisions within the free grace movement and the distinctive between GES versus FGA and GSOT is the issue of whether Jesus, deity, death, and resurrection are essential content of the saving message. It has puzzled me why there is so much heat and controversy over the issue of the necessity of Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection in comparison to the amount of heat and controversy over whether eternal life, eternal security is the central content of the saving message. Regarding which of these issues is more important, I would ask the following questions. 
How many people do you know who believe in Jesus for everlasting life, but reject Jesus' deity, death on the cross, and resurrection? Frankly, I don't know of anybody. I know there are people who have believed in Jesus for everlasting life, but still not yet understand or are ignorant of certain aspects of Jesus' deity, death, or resurrection. I myself was once one of these individuals, but I've yet to meet anyone who is believing in Jesus for eternal life and knows about Jesus' deity, death, and resurrection, and yet still rejects those doctrines as untrue. I also have never run across anyone believing in a frog named Jesus or Jesus down the street for everlasting life or an atheist believing in Jesus for everlasting life, although these types of hypotheticals have been offered up as what Zane or GS believes. Zane has been clear on multiple occasions that one's faith in Jesus for eternal life must be in Jesus of the New Testament. Given the lack of real live people who fit these hypotheticals being offered as proof, I really don't understand the amount of attention and focus given to the, to the deity list or the crossless controversies. I've heard hypothetical after hypothetical, but I've yet to meet anyone who is a living example of any of these hypotheticals. But let's look at the second question. How many people do you know who believe Jesus is God, died on the cross for sins, rose again, but reject that Jesus gives everlasting life to every believer in him? They believe a lifeless gospel, as Bob Wilkin describes in his new book, The Gospel is Still Under Siege. We all know people who fit this category. In fact, the majority of professing Christendom would fit this category, as there are many who believe that Jesus is God, died on the cross for sins, and rose again, but think they need their own works to get or to keep everlasting life, and they reject that everlasting life is a free gift received solely by believing in Jesus for it. I've never been one that enjoyed spending much time on hypotheticals that have little to no basis in reality. These deity and crossless gospel issues are purely hypothetical with no practical relevance. These hypotheticals are a major distraction, whereas the issue of professing Christians who do not believe in Jesus for everlasting life is a real problem. The lifeless gospel is the real problem, not the deity-less or crossless gospel. One potential explanation for prior unity and current division is that someone's views changed. This is Dr. Wilson's claim in his 2020 book. Dr. Wilson specifically claims that Zane changed his gospel message and devotes two out of nine chapters of his book in trying to prove this. I've written a response to Dr. Wilson's claims, and my conclusion is that Zane did not change his view on the gospel. I have copies of my response to Dr. Wilson if you like one. Don Ryer also has an excellent article in the 2010 GS Journal titled, Zane Hodges and GS Did Not Change the Gospel. Dr. Anderson also seeks to perpetuate this claim that GS and Zane Hodges changed. If you recall from this morning, Dr. Anderson called the 2005 additions to the GS doctoral statement new doctrines. Dr. Anderson also claims that he never heard Zane teach belief in Jesus for eternal life until 2005. He writes in his five-star review of Wilson's Heresy of the GS, quote, I took every class Zane Hodges taught at DTS, spent a summer working with him on the majority text of 2 Corinthians, had dinner with him every Friday night that summer, spent another summer going to Victory Street Chapel, and have about 50 of his recorded sermons. Never in all that time did I hear him audibly equate the gospel with believing that Jesus is the guarantor of eternal life, interpreted as eternal security. Suddenly, in 2005, I was hearing that one must believe in eternal security to have eternal security. End quote. I'm at a loss why it took Dr. Anderson until 2005 to finally hear this, but Zane was teaching belief in Jesus for eternal life from his early days, and even in his writings and messages from the 70s and 80s. I invite you to go to zanehodges.org and start listening to various sermon messages. All of them were given before 2005. You don't need to listen to anywhere near 50 messages to hear Zane repeatedly present the gospel as believe in Jesus for eternal life. Zane and G.S. did not change their gospel message. So is it possible instead that Drs. Anderson, Bing, Wilson, and Dillow changed? Let's take a look. If we look at the writings of Dr. Anderson, Bing, Wilson, and Dillow, we can see changes in their views, where in times past they were more closely aligned with the focused free grace position especially during the period when they were speaking and writing for GS prior to 2006. In 99, Dr. Anderson published a journal article in the Schaefer Theological Journal titled The Nature of Faith. Almost 20 years later, Dr. Anderson in 2018 published essentially the same article as a chapter in his book, Free Grace Soteriology, but with significant theological changes. 
Your handout will display corresponding passages between 2018 and 1999 side by side. Here's a quote from Dr. Anderson in 2018 on whether faith is a decision. In 2018, Anderson does not consider it wrong to include a decision in faith, and that one can decide to receive the gift or reject it. However, the corresponding section in Anderson's 99 article conveys a completely opposite definition of faith. In 99, it is bad terminology to speak of a decision for Christ. And R.T. Kendall is correct to liken belief as a persuasion instead of a decision. Also in 99, Anderson praises Zane for seeing faith as a passive persuasion. This praise of Zane and the subsequent quote from Zane is omitted in Anderson's 2018 chapter. In addition, Anderson has the following in his 2018 book, which is omitted from his 99 article. Quote, It should be obvious from this chart that we believe the volition of man plays a significant role in the essence of faith. However, that role is to commit to the claims of Christ as to his person and work, not a commitment to obey all of Christ's commandments. To claim that exponents of free grace view faith as an intellectual exercise is patently false. End quote. Here again, in 2018, Anderson makes it clear that he now views faith as including a volitional element or an act of one's will. Anderson's changed view of faith fits with his testimony given in 2021, which was played this morning. According to Anderson, he already believed Jesus was the Son of God, died on the cross for his sins, buried, rose, and went up to heaven. But Anderson assures us that he wasn't even close to being a Christian. What is missing? For focus free grace, the answer is believing in Jesus for everlasting life. Instead, the turning point for Anderson is volitional and an act of the will. He realized that he was drowning in sin and needed a savior, and then asked Jesus to save him. Then boom, Anderson considers himself born again, although he didn't know what it was. Anderson is also unclear on what he is assured of, as you can't be assured of something you don't know what it is. Here's a quote from the conclusion section from Dr. Anderson's 2018 chapter on faith. In 2018, when describing what is saving faith, Anderson states that saving faith needs to be tethered to the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is vague and fits the flexible free grace view, where eternal life is a result of believing in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and eternal life is not necessary to be the object of faith or what we believe in Jesus for. However, the corresponding conclusion in 99 by Dr. Anderson is much closer to the focus free grace view. He still speaks of faith in an eternally saving object and believe a message offering eternal life. And saving faith is tethered to the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Notice that in both of his tether quotations, there is a mention of the person and work of Jesus Christ but in 2018, Anderson has dropped the words, quote, alone for eternal life, end quote, as part of his description of what is saving faith. By 2018, Anderson considers eternal life as optional content of saving faith. Here are Dr. Anderson's words from his 2018 chapter on faith. In 2018, Anderson does not use the word believe in his concluding words, but instead speaks of trust. There is no mention of the gift of eternal life, and his 2018 conclusion is longer than his 98 conclusion. In 2018, one must not only be persuaded and confident, but somehow one must appropriate these promises. This persuasion and confidence is not that, Jesus, that Christ has given one eternal life, but is a persuasion and confidence since as a, quote, only hope for life eternal, end quote. Hope is an interesting word choice, as hope denotes lack of certainty. In addition, what does one receive with this act of trust? It is not eternal life, but opening the gates of heaven. In contrast, Anderson's 99 conclusion is actually a model of clarity that is consistent with focus-free grace. Here in 99, Anderson concludes with saving faith as believing in Jesus' death on the cross for sins to give one the gift of eternal life. The biblical terms of believe and eternal life are used, instead of terms not found in the Bible, like an act of trust and open the gates of heaven. Dr. Bing, from his 2018 Grace Notes number 79, states, John's gospel does not demand belief in eternal life, which can never be lost. This stands in stark contrast to his 98 evangelistic booklet, where he states, 
Now, do you believe God's promise that if you trust Christ alone as your Savior, he will give you eternal life? If so, you are born again into God's family with eternal life as your possession forever. Here in 98, being asked if one is trusting Jesus as Savior for eternal life, where in 2018 he claims the Gospel of John does not demand belief in eternal life which can never be lost. Recall my morning session that Dr. Bing made the following statement in 2018. The doctrine of eternal security is a wonderful and comforting assurance that those who have eternal life can never lose it. But to demand that an unsaved person grasp this in order to be saved is an unnecessary addition to the saving gospel. A person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior who died for their sins and rose again is adequate for salvation. Prior to Great Snow's number 79 in 2018, we can see a marked difference in how Dr. Bing presented the gospel. These are all quotes from Grace Notes prior to number 79. In these quotes, Dr. Bing repeatedly states the two pillars of the focus-free grace view. Number one, believe in Jesus for the promise of eternal life. And number two, the assurance that comes with believing such promise. Bing also defines believing or faith as being convinced or persuaded. Let's focus on a few of these quotes. In 2007, Dr. Bing wrote, Once we have shared the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done for us through his death and resurrection, we should invite people to believe in his promise of eternal life. Only by believing in Jesus Christ for eternal life are we saved. In 2008, Dr. Bing wrote, We believe Christ for something, and that is eternal life. A person must believe or be persuaded that the promise is true and true for himself. Again in 2008, Dr. Bing wrote that faith is simply faith. It means that one is convinced or persuaded that something is true, so that there is personal appropriation of that truth. God can draw us to himself, convict us of the gospel's truth, and invite us to receive eternal life. But it is our responsibility to believe the gospel for eternal life. In 2016, Bing writes, Those who are taught that they can have assurance by looking at their faith can be deceived because they can have great faith in some facts about Jesus, but not believe in him and his promise of eternal life. Finally, in 2018, in Grace Note 77, Bing writes, the objective proof and assurance of salvation comes from God's promise of eternal life through Christ and the fact that a person believes in Christ according to that promise. These quotes prior to Grace Notes number 79 in 2018 are consistent with the Focus Free Grace View. Believe Jesus' promise of eternal life to all who believe in him for it. And when you believe Jesus' promise, you are assured that you have eternal life. Starting with the publication of Grace Notes number 79 in 2018, we see a change in how Dr. Bing presents the gospel. You see in these quotes that Dr. Bing, instead of emphasizing believing in Jesus for eternal life, now favors believing in Jesus as Savior. As I've covered in the morning session, this Savior, according to flexible free gracers, does not need to be a Savior that provides for an eternally secure salvation. But a person can believe in a Savior that provides for a temporary or probationary salvation. You can also see where assurance of eternal life is no longer emphasized, as these quotes leave open the possibility that a person believes in Jesus as Savior for something other than eternal salvation. In other words, one may believe in Jesus as the Savior who provides a salvation that is temporary, conditional, or maybe lost. Finally, faith is no longer just a conviction or persuasion of the truth. Faith is more than mental assent, but could appeal to the will also. I should caveat that at times, Dr. Bing will still present the gospel as believing in Jesus for eternal life or for eternal salvation, and connect assurance of eternal life to believing Jesus' promise. However, like other flexible free gracers, they can preach about the promise and gift of eternal life since it is optional. So there is flexibility whether to include eternal life. However, when eternal life may be confusing or serve as a stumbling block to an unbeliever, flexible free gracers may drop it from their gospel message because it is an unnecessary addition to the saving message. Since Grace Notes number 79, there is a decline by Dr. Bing in emphasizing believing Jesus' promise of everlasting life and the assurance that necessarily comes with believing such promise. Remember my morning talk at the following quotation from Dr. Wilson? Yes, Jesus did promise us eternal life but a guarantee of eternal life as the object of faith is absent. Jesus as guarantor of eternal life security is absent. The promise is never stated to be the object of our faith. 
In 2020, Dr. Wilson is clear that eternal life security is not part of the saving message. For Dr. Wilson, we don't have a lot of writings prior to 2006 to evaluate. But Dr. Wilson did write for Grace and Focus in 2003 in an article regarding children's understanding of the gospel. Dr. Wilson wrote in 2003, I was able to explain that the sole requirement is believing that Jesus guarantees eternal life to all who believe in him. Interestingly enough, Dr. Wilson in his 2020 book provides no explanation and even fails to acknowledge this statement he made in 2003. Now we come to Dr. Dillo. I believe Dr. Dillo has been consistent in his beliefs with regards to faith being defined as a two-step trust and saving faith requiring only some assurance or some hope instead of assurance being full certainty. However, I do believe that his view of repentance has certainly changed materially since the publication of The Reign of the Servant Kings in 92, when compared with his 2018 book, Final Destiny. As I described this morning, Dr. Wilson, 2018, believes repentance is a requirement for eternal life and defines repentance as including, quote, a desire to be different, wanting a new way of life, which includes moral change, and a desire for a new way of life. When we examine the sections in Dr. Dillow's 92 book, which discuss repentance, repentance when required for salvation is a change of mind that one is a sinner and that Jesus is God. Such salvific repentance does not include a desire for moral change or a desire for a new way of life. Dr. Dillow considers salvific repentance and faith to be synonymous. When repentance is a change of mind about sin, Dr. Dillow is clear in 92 that such type of repentance is not a condition of, for salvation. However, by 2018, salvific repentance includes a desire to be different, desiring moral change, and a desire for a new way of life. The repentance quotations where a willingness for moral change is required for salvation all come from the same subsection in Dillow's 2018 Final Destiny. This subsection is titled, Repentance is a Necessary Precursor to Saving Faith. This subsection is new, and there is no corresponding subsection in his 92 Reign of the Servant Kings. I hope today's talk has given you some perspective on the history of GS and an explanation of the greater unity within GS in times past. However, I do think too much discussion has centered around whether a view is new or novel, or whether someone has changed their view from times past. I want to caveat that not all change is bad. Change from error to truth is a good thing. I have undergone a number of these changes myself. I once did not believe in Jesus for eternal life, but now I do. I used to think it was necessary to close an evangelistic encounter with a sinner's prayer. I no longer do, as I understand that adding any volitional act in addition to belief creates confusion. I used to have a two-step trust definition of faith and have used the getting on the airplane illustration to distinguish trust from belief. Now I just use the biblical terms, believe in faith, and understand faith as simply a conviction of the truth. I used to state the saving message imprecisely, accept Jesus as your personal savior, but now prefer the biblical terms of believe Jesus for the free gift of everlasting life. I used to think repentance is a change of mind about whether one is a sinner and a need for a savior. I now understand repentance to be turning from sins, but never a condition of eternal life, as the Gospel of John never uses the term repent. I used to have little to no conception of the importance of eternal reward. But now I know that the Lord Jesus has given us eternal reward as something to motivate us and to focus on. I understand that some, and possibly even the teachers mentioned today, may take issue with the interpretation that they have changed their views from times past. But ultimately, whether any teacher, Wilkin, Hodges, Anderson, Bing, Wilson, or Dillo, has or has not changed their views is irrelevant. The question really is, what does the Word of God say? The test of the truth of our convictions isn't whether they have remained consistent throughout time or whether they align with tradition. We should always be open to change when confronted with contrary evidence in the Word of God. When considering the truth of the gospel, it'd be more helpful for everyone if the focus becomes, what does the Bible say, instead of who has changed their views. Actually, Zane warned against the danger of not testing and not changing our views by the light of Scripture back at the 2001 GS conference, and I'd like to conclude with his words. The issues I've just discussed are examples only, of course. They are intended to remind us 
that the grace movement must bring all of its convictions to the bar of Scripture. And we must be prepared to revise those convictions, however God's word requires. No movement can remain vital, which no longer examines itself in the light of Scripture. When such examination of our convictions ceases, tradition and dead orthodoxy are not far down the road. All right. Uh, I think there's time for questions. Yeah. So can we take uh, regular uh, oral questions so far? Is it Okay. Or you can send one in by writing, but... Who's got a question for us? Okay, Scott. Uh, this is a question for Bob. Were your convictions about repentance about the same as Jody Dillow's in 1992? Uh, No, uh, back when I was on staff with Campus Crusade, they were similar to what he had. When I was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, I would never bring up repentance. But um, if someone asked me, do I have to stop drinking, do I have to stop sleeping around, I would say no, but you've got to be willing because God may change your desires. And I remember telling Zane Hodges I used to say that, and he nearly fell on the floor. He was like, that's horrible. I said, I know. (laughs) And that was the first time I realized that that was like 1981. But no, my view at that point was a person had to change their mind about Christ, which is why defined as believing in him. So it would have been different. But we're asking Mike questions, right? No, I'm happy to defer to Bob. Yeah, yeah. Mike, can you talk a little bit about the... um, uh, motivations for why you think they might have changed their perspective or uh, particularly, you know, how do we in our churches make sure that um, the the force behind changing those perspectives, um, you know, isn't uh, manifested in our churches? So, um, I guess for motivations, I, I can't really say what people's motivations are. Um, but I think for, in terms of our own churches, I think, I think Zane's conclusion is, is what's up. We always need to be testing our convictions and revising our convictions if necessary, if, you know, where the God reveals that they're, they're in error and, and uh, change the truth, you know. You know, I mean, I, I, mean I, I find that I think a lot of the changes, I would say, at least my perspective is that they're not consistent with the Word of God. I mean, the Word of God is very clear. John's Gospel is the sole, you know, book of the Bible meant for evangelism. Uh, the definition of believe is clear. I, I think you can see from when, this morning when I rephrased the verses, they don't make sense, you know. And I, that's the way I, uh, you know, literally with the Lordship Salvation controversy, I rephrase like John 3.16. It, it says believe. It doesn't say, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave of God's Son, that whoever surrenders, obeys, commits... You know, and so, I, you know, I think God has made his word clear, but I do think Satan is actively at work trying to confuse people. Yeah. I have a question from Italy. So um, the question is, I don't get how they can use the word synonym with regards to repentance and belief slash faith. You just can't use the one in place of the other, but you have to expand the meaning of repentance as change of mind to connect it to belief. Am I missing something here? I, I think, you know, I mean, I used to hold the change of mind view because I thought this is an easy way to explain away passages that I had problems with. And I understand, like, well, you know, I guess in some sense I changed my mind about who Jesus was when I first believed, uh, you know. Um, but... You know, I think ultimately, you know, the Bible uses the, the support to use repentance as needed to, believe, you know, for eternal life. Is you know, as John Nehemiah showed us, the concept isn't even in the, the Gospel of John. So I, I don't think it's helpful to continue to, you know, use terms the way God did not intend them to be used. Yeah. Yeah. Or I, I think it's Bob Bryan. I, I I love that quote too from Zane. You know. We're not saved by believing biblical language. We're saved by believing biblical truth. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, even the Lordship folks will say, I believe in faith alone. 
But faith for them is obey, rep- you know, surrender. You know, so they, they, they use the same words, but they, have, they don't have the biblical meaning. They don't have the biblical definitions. Uh, yes, this is back, back to motives again. Yeah. Um, again, I, I, know, I, I know some of these guys, okay? Yeah. And I have a lot, of, a lot of respect for them. And I'm kind of trying to wonder what really happened. Up until today, or yesterday and today, I thought the main issue was the crossless gospel. But what I've learned here in this conference, it's they think we've added to the gospel. Right. <laughs> and so... Where, where does that kind of thinking come from? How, how do you arrive at something like that? I guess maybe I'll answer it based on my experiences with you know one of these flexible free gracers. Um, when that situation came in the church, a lot of his arguments was, Mike, if what you're saying is true, my grandfather is in hell. My friends and you know my old friends from you know, the neighborhood are all doing hell. And I told him, I'm not saying that at all. If they ever believe that Jesus Christ, that he gives eternal life simply by faith, they'll be there no matter what they believe in today. I don't know if they have or they haven't. But it, it seems like a lot of the motivation sometimes I sense is they want to see some loved one, some friend, you know, in, in the kingdom. And so they, there's, a, I guess, a confirmation bias. They want the message to be so broad that anyone who basically professes some form of Christian by agreeing to something very basic about Jesus they get in for that without, you know, believing the saving message. Yeah. Mike, this was really good work. Oh, thank you. Your book, Responding to Ken Wilson, is my, my favorite contribution to the entire controversy. <laughs> Very focused and, and to the point and, and excellent, excellent work. I was wondering, is there a reason for uh, focusing the responses around uh, the baby boomers, the older guys that are starting to move into retirement, as opposed to a lot of the younger theologians who right now are starting to emerge and gain momentum and often hold much more extreme and dangerous views than some of the guys that were, were in this session. Yeah, I guess my selection of these individuals basically because of their connection with GES. And um, I guess if, you know, I, I am well aware that there's, cert- there's definitely younger theologians who have these the same views out there, and yeah, I can say, but I think in terms of like, you know, I think most of them weren't around in 2006. Um, I guess I'm guess I guess I'm old now too, since I was around. I wasn't here at the GS conference, but I was around in 2006, and I did hear about what happened. Um, but you know, I think for my, my goal in this is not to say like, oh, okay, A, B, C, and D, these people are off. It's you understand the issues, you understand what the Bible teaches. And you can spot it for yourself when you come across it. And that's what, you know, we want to teach people how to fish, not just give them the fish. So, Amen. yeah. Okay, I got an online question. Then we got about three more, which we probably don't have time for. But if you can give 30-second answers, maybe we can get a bunch Okay, of, I'm sorry. How is John 6, to 47 related to salvation? That's talking about, you know, being drawn. But it also talks about he who believes in me has everlasting life. So, is drawing, is there some volitional component, um, or do we, you know, unable because of the drawing, or do you want to even go to there? I mean, I, I would, I mean, God does the drawing, um, but in terms of what God's drawing and, and man's role, I would just point you to uh, two articles from Zane in Grace and Focus, you know, God's role in conversion and man's role in conversion. Th- those are excellent articles that tell you, you know, man's responsibility is to believe, man is able to believe. But no man is ever going to believe without the drawing of God. Yeah. Okay, the, um, the flexible free grace, how does that play in with the lordship salvation? Is there any crossover there, or are they totally separate? I would say that there is crossover in the terms of the flexible free grace folks view the lordship mes- salvation message as a saving message. Um, uh, there. And then I guess, uh, as I covered earlier more, some of them actually, you know, I say have the same view of repentance as lordship view. Um, you need to have a willingness to make moral change. I don't see how that is any different from being willing to give up one's sins. Yeah. Uh, just, just a clarification on the crossless gospel debate. It wasn't that, it wasn't that people rejected the death 
and resurrection of Christ is whether you even need to know about it. Is that correct? Or Yeah, but, um, yeah the, the, the debate is, as, as you describe it, it's, uh, do you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose again, or, or do you need to believe that Jesus is God? Are those essential content of the saving message? But then that morphed into, that's the whole content. Remember the quote he had from the FGA, and it said some people call it the promise-only gospel? Well, they have a promise-less gospel. But not then. Back then, they had promise plus death, deity, resurrection. Right? But your point is, now you don't have to believe in the promise. Yeah, for, for a long time, I thought those folks who were you know, saying crossless, deityless, that they would just have those as additional elements to be, in addition to believing in Jesus for eternal life. I only later discovered that, no, actually some of them had dropped everlasting life to begin with. I'm sure there's still some in that group who, you know, still maintain that you'd have to believe in Jesus for everlasting life or, you know, eternal security. But, you know, I, I mean, some that I thought were, then I later see that they start questioning assurance of the essence. So I, I really don't know if they're still, I mean, I hope they're still in the focus free grace view, but I, I, you know, I really don't know. Yeah. All right, let's give him a hand. <laughs>